maturing team and the young boys were coming on great. You know, people like uh, Gary Pallister had come into the team, Paul Ince, they were all settling down. And they were getting used to playing, you know, for Manchester United and uh, actually having to win a competition. So the FA Cup would give them a lot of confidence in that. Um, and the rose to the challenge, great. Left back, an inspired run on the far side. A chance here, and a goal! That was the start of it. Then anything was possible for Manchester United after that. Manchester United have won the FA Cup. They equaled the record of seven outright wins. Manchester United celebrate Alex Ferguson's first major trophy at Old Trafford. There was a feeling that uh, that, that was the first of hopefully many um, trophies to come. There was a definite wind of change. We were building some substance about the whole squad. They were great, great characters. I mean, they, they took that character on the field as well, you know, and the characters shone through when they were playing football. So Alex, to get them all t together, to perform the way they did, you know, took a, took a, took a hell of an effort. Uh, but it was a fantastic sight. We just wanted to obviously get out there as, as a Manchester United team and uh, pitch up against the best. We had terrific players like Neil Webb, Mick Phelan in midfield, Brian Robson when he was fit playing in there as well, so the side was developing. It was a real team, you know, that's the manager's always belief in that, but the success of that group of players was the fact that we all believed in each other and that the manager also had a, a saying at times is we, you should be able to look around and uh, be glad that he was in the team today, you know, and you'd be happy thinking if those players were, if you're going into the trenches with those players that they would be at your shoulder when you had to, uh, when the whistle came. We were the first team back in after the, the ISIL disaster, so we felt, to a certain extent, I think, that we were flying the flag for, for British football again, and uh, so we wanted to make a, a good fist of it and try, and try and make an impression. After ISIL, and were banned for five years, you know, I'd I'd, be, I'd gone to the semi-final of the European Cup with Aberdeen the year before, and then the next season I'm not getting European football. You know, so it was strange for me because I'd been used to the, England, the, the European football, whereas England there was this uh, five-year ban. Well, I hadn't never heard of them to be honest, and um, but that's that's a strange thing, or the, you know, that going into the unknown, you know, when you don't know what you're up against. I mean, Hungarian football was 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 decent at the time, and you just because English clubs hadn't been involved for five years, I think it was a bit of a uh, a new journey, so to speak, and we didn't know really what to expect. Yeah, I suppose it was a bit daunting, really, to to think about you know what we were letting ourselves into, but um, exciting as well at the same time. I'd played in Europe for Celtic, so. I had some really good experiences, including a, a full house with at, uh, Old Trafford with Celtic, then Stratford Vienna, and European nights were always very special. So the, the fact that I had been down here for a couple of years, you'd missed that. So I think it was very exciting. Also, the manager had had a lot of success with um, with Aberdeen. We didn't know a great deal about them. They were totally unknown to us. But the manager had done his homework and. He gave his advice about the players um, and what to look for and you know who we were playing against. So that was quite good. There was nothing to gauge us on the last five years. So um, you know it was it was like being all young lads and let, let, they let us loose on the Cup Winners' Cup. Everybody knew how important it was going back into Europe, uh, how the fans behaved and how the teams actually did in the competition. Uh, so it was a massive challenge for us that year. First game back in Europe for over five years. Um, I was, you know, it was a massive game for us and uh, I just remember hitting a long ball down the line, I think it was for Ince, I got back up, supported him, he was rolling back to me and I 
cut inside and hit it with the outside of my boot and it swerved for about 10 yards. It's probably one of the most movement we've seen on the ball from me. Very similar position, just a little chipping into the far post and Webb had made a good run. Doesn't make many runs, but because he's usually the deliverer with the ball, he's a passer, but he made a run into the box and I happened to put him through for the goal. Oh, good turn by Webb! Obviously we won. Uh, any more detail, you'll have to ask somebody else. The referee blows the final whistle and Manchester United, in their return to European football after five years, I found this goalkeeper a strange mixture. I think we set up to make sure we didn't concede in the, in the second game over there. I mean, abiding memory of, of the game over in, in Pesky was uh, was the United supporters dressed as Santa Claus. Now, I don't know why. Going into that sort of area of Europe as well wasn't wasn't easy at that time from travelling points of view and what facilities you were going to get when you got there. But we knew that we had a good chance. We were always confident that we could go away from home in Europe and win football matches. It was a great experience to go to some of the places we'd never we'd never seen before and you know experience that European football competition. You know the travelling bit. You know getting getting to something different. You know playing against players. You know with different different kind of principles of how they play. You're playing against people, you have you no idea what the strengths or what the weaknesses are, what the atmosphere is going to be like in the crowd. So it was an adventure, it was exciting. Uh, I think that's why you know the players love Europe, the fans love Europe, uh, because you're never quite sure what to expect. We found it difficult over there, you know, it was a difficult, tight little ground in Hungary. Um, it was a red hot day for a member. As it turned out, the pitch was small, it was bumpy, it was dry, and uh, my main memory was we got a free kick about 15 minutes to go. I actually remember it getting getting the free kick and and it must have been about 35 yards out. And Pallister's a good striker of the ball. You know that any for 35 yards out and that we should be allowing Pallister to maybe have a pop at the goal. I remember Archie Knock shouting over from the bench, go on Pally, have a go. Right, Pally, you're the man to take this free kick. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> I think he'd been moaning to the manager for weeks, oh, can I take free kicks? And he, I think he'd said, yeah, go on, we'll let you have a try, see how you get on. And it was probably the worst one I've ever seen up to, up to this day, probably. He got and stubbed his toe, kicked the ground, and the ball rolled about five yards. It was a, a rather embarrassing um, piece of footage that I hope you haven't got. And the only time we ever took a free kick again was when we won the title in the last game in, you know, against Blackburn, we'd already won the title. We allowed him to take a free kick. Out of, out of um, sympathy, and he scored. It was a tough tie, but not a, a real one where we were never in danger of going out. Turn the ball in now, and the header goes in from Brian McLear. Since I would been out of Europe for such a long time, and then to, to actually come into the competition and play as well as what the boys did, um, you know, it was a great effort from everybody. I didn't even know we played Wrexham in the Cup Winners' Cup. Getting to my age now and being 20 years on then, it uh, takes a while to, to grasp all these things back again. Well, I was, I was delighted to, uh, when I heard that, obviously, at my hometown club, and I, I was really looking forward to it. It's fantastic, isn't it, that Wrexham had got so far in the competition. We got an incredible draw. Both games were going to be sellouts. And uh, it, was, it was a harder... Uh, it was, a, it was much harder than the pros where the, the results suggest. Pallister waits for the corner. It's Steve Bruce though. It's Brian McClare. It's United in front. Brian would just go on and do the job. He wouldn't mold. Uh, and he'd just uh, have the work ethic, you know, for the team. Lee Sharp. Taking on Phillips again. The contest between the United wingers and the Wrexham fullbacks really have been absolutely gripping. 
This fella's never far away from the contest. Hughes all the way. Penalty. A double breakthrough on the cards. Nigel Beaumont upended Mark Hughes. Now, who's got the better nerve? Steve Bruce, just. Mark Morris, the goalkeeper, got a hat to it. I hope you've got the foot as your mind go from that now that you've you hopefully lost the pesky one catch free kick. Sharp finding Webb. That's another teaser towards Steve Bruce. Good header under pressure. Gary Pallister, great goal! Oh, he enjoyed that. That was my only European goal, so I was delighted with that. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, we won the game. 3-0 comfortably at home. I always remember that in between the two ties, we played Liverpool in a wee cup tie, and Mark Hughes got a terrible ankle injury. I think I scored a goal, but I had to come off at half-time, and then I think we were playing Wrexham the week following, and, uh, and I was des desperate to play. So he comes up to me in the bus, he says, my ankle's OK. I says, don't be silly. Well, we'd ruled him out for a month. Obviously, uh, my, my ankle strapped up, but... I was trying to convince myself and, and the gaffer that uh, I was fit, but I apparently wasn't. I said, well, you save yourself for Derby County on Saturday. Just think about that. But um, he came out and trained. I had him in the youth team, and I mean, he used to come off black and blue even then. You know, everybody used to kick Sparky. Man used to kick him back as well. You know, he was a bit of a brute. And he was desperate playing his right some, but I couldn't take the chance. Every centre-back, I mean, it's different now because if they'd known what they did then, the centre-backs would have been off after 10 minutes. But everybody kicks Parky, you know. And uh, I know he was really, really excited when it was, when it was Wrexham. And uh, what a signal. We quickly found out from European rules that you had to spend the day before in the country that you've competing in. So even though Wrexham was 45 minutes down the road, we had to go the day before. And stay, and stay in a hotel. I seem to remember we, we had a training session on, on a park pitch about a mile from, from the hotel that wrecks them. And you think of it now, and I mean, it's, it's crazy. It would never happen to a Manchester night team. We just sort of patch of grass and say, well, we'll train there just before the game. So I don't think that happens now. Obviously, this stand wasn't here. This has just been built. But I think that stand, the front seats there weren't there. That was, a bit, that was standing as well. I know that's the same because when I played at schoolboy level, that was the same. And it's not changed one bit. Maybe they put a new roof on it, but it's the same stand. As Wrexham backpedal furiously under pressure, particularly from Ince, they began and in the end set up the shot which finished the move. But Phelan was a little bit wild with his effort. Ince looking dangerous, it's a great run this by Ince. The goal poacher, Mark Robbins. Mark was a very, very good finisher. An outstanding finisher. When he got a chance, he could score. But Pallister reaches it and kept off the line at first, but I'm afraid, as far as Wrexham are concerned, it wasn't enough because following in was Bruce, and that's 2 0. Used to knock the corners in for him, and knowing that he'd throw his head in there, as you can tell now, but. Um, yeah, he was fantastic for us, Brucey. And it was close to Full House. I don't know, it probably wasn't being in Wrexham. We haven't got enough people in uh, Wrexham to fill it. And they give me enough stick anyway, the, amount, the ones who were here. But it was nice to turn them over, obviously. The final word is winning. And uh, all the stick for 90 minutes off the, the North Walians, it was nice to turn them over in the end. Valderrama, I think, plays for, for Montpellier as well. so. He stood out as well, <laughs> for other reasons, mainly his hairstyle. There's Valderrama, unmistakable. In the home leg, the, the team photograph up, you see? And uh, the, the Montpellier's team photograph, and of course, Valderrama's sticks to our mile. And Viv Anderson, uh, Steve Briss has got a programme, he's looking at the programme, and Viv Anderson leaned over his shoulder and says, which one's Valderrama? Briss goes, there he is. <laughs> yeah, that was a really tough side, probably the tougher side that we were going to face and it was very, very hostile and of course they held us at home. Well here they come to a crowd of around about 40,000. European competition such a big part of the old Trafford tradition. It was Manchester United who pioneered the very concept. It's good to uh, see them doing so again. And really a special night for British football as well. United are the last British survivors and here's Lee Sharp.
Making a great pass to Claire! A wonderful start for Manchester United! A fabulous start by United! Phelan forcing it through to McClare, tries to get it back to Ince. Over on this right-hand side, both Robson and Blackmore. Blackmore with a lot of pace here, gets a corner. They mustn't concede anything here tonight, Manchester United. Away goals in the event of the tie finishing, finishing level on aggregate. Away goals do count double. You know, we won the lot, things were going great, and then all of a sudden their left winger played a fantastic ball across the box. And I just stuck my foot out to try and put it out for a corner, and it bounced off my shin, it bounced up off my shin and just flew in the back of the net and it looked just ridiculous, a ridiculous own goal. You probably won't see many worse. This could be a problem, it's a goal, an own goal there by Martin. And I just stood there, I didn't know what to do because it was, I was so embarrassed and I thought, you know, what's the manager going to think and the lads have let the lads down. And so that was it, I'd equalised for them, it was one all um, and that's how the game finished. So it wasn't best pleased. No, nobody really said much about it, to be honest. The manager didn't say anything, he, he knew probably how I felt and, you know, that I needed to react to that. And the, that last didn't say anything either. Montpellier were a little bit um, sure of themselves after that result because I think they felt as though they'd done the uh, they'd done the tie. We went there quite relaxed, really. You know, I think we, we we went and we trained on the pitch. We allowed the supporters into the to, to watch us training, which was unusual, you know, at the time. Um, but Montpellier were a good club, at, particularly at home. But we knew that our record was uh, was okay away from home, and we knew we could take them on. We stayed in um, a lovely little place just outside Marseille, and in the morning, and after we'd had lunch, we would, we all usually go back to the rooms for a for a nap or just to rest anyway. And uh, but there was a hell of a racket coming from somewhere. I mean, real ridiculous noise. I think, what the hell is this going on? It was disturbing, you know. And uh, Jim McGregor, who was a physio at the time, had uh, went to investigate. And then we, we must have been quite high up in the hotel. So the floor above, he put it across the floor deliberately. <laughs> yes, until he did stood and watched her for a period of time until she'd kind of noticed him. And she went, then stopped doing it, you know. So I'm not saying that there was anything, but she was uh, certainly doing it. For their purpose. They got stuck into us, particularly in the away leg. I mean, we had an awful lot of work to be done away from home. I think it was the first time I encountered these. They had drums behind the goal, uh, behind one of the goals or something like that. And uh, these player, these people playing drums the whole, the whole match. That was uh, in the away game. To be honest, after 35 minutes, they were miles a better team. They were all over us. Valderrama was playing. I think Lauren Blanc was at the back. And we needed something to happen, really. Clayton Blackmore. Um, hit a shot from from a distance of a free kick, uh, and the keeper probably should have saved it, but it, it slipped through his uh, hands. Blackmore shot, and it's in there. United have scored. A wonderful break for Manchester United. Always fancied his chances in those in those positions, but uh, yeah, the keeper made a, a real pig's ear of it, and uh, we were thankful for that. I think it did change. They did change the game because they looked like they lost their heads a wee bit after that. Yeah, they, they were quite aggressive, and um, I quite enjoyed that. I mean, people remember how I played. Uh, I quite used to like uh, going up against teams that try to intimidate you physically. So we stood up to the challenge, and uh, I think there was a little bit of controversy. I think. There's a referee's whistle. Yes, and I'll tell you why. He's actually spat at Mark Hughes there. I saw it happen. And it's, well, it's got to be a, it's got to be a red card then. I think it it's will. It's got be. to be a red card. Fetis, who got a yellow card less than two minutes ago, gets a red card now. And so, for the second time, Montpellier are reduced to ten men. I remember going for a tackle, and the, the geese, I mean, the ball was over there. And the geezer's come from there and just gone right down my side of my leg, down there, Sorry, uh, with his studs, and it just all opened up. And I remember what Gary, I think Gary Lineker was doing, doing the game that day, interview, and he said, oh, I can't believe our points has come off with a grass bird. Clearly in a lot of pain, Paul Ince. And he'd been having a good game through that midfield. He'd been nicking in, making some good interceptions. He has nice been working passing. very hard, Brian. I think what he might have done there was skid along the pitch and took his skin off, the grass burn you were talking about earlier with Steve Bruce. And we got to the airport and he was going up the stairs. I went, oi, you, come here. Like that. 
Yeah, what, what? So I said, is that, is that grass burn? He went, oh, do you know what I mean? And it wound me up because, you know, I've never come off with a grass burn. That's ridiculous. Never, you know, and it was, it was a bad, bad tackle, to be fair. And, um, but as I said, we won the game, so I wasn't too concerned. Not very often if you get a cut or a gash in your leg that you have to come off. It was that bad. It was like a big hole in his leg. Um, so I went on at half time. Um, and the one thing I remember about that is um, Michelle Platini came in the dressing room at half time with Bobby Charlton. Um, and he was one of my, my idols, Platini. And I thought, it was just magical and I was coming on to play in the game and that just gave me a boost I suppose but that was fantastic. And obviously Vinci went off and then I moved from left back into midfield so I got to get a bit further forward and uh, got brought down in the box for the penalty. Blackmore's getting in there as well now feel and get it across in comes Blackmore brought down a penalty United now get a penalty the referee runs away from the Montpellier protests and United now have a perfect chance to give themselves a cushion of a second goal. There's the incident. I remember taking a penalty, I think it was a penalty I think I scored with and thought, you know, the, one of them pressure ones when you're a penalty taker, you think you've got to, you've got to score here because there was nothing really in the game up until then. He ended up with 19 goals that season, but it was a fantastic performance by him. I used to get these letters in for your fans. Why don't you play Bruce's centre forward? It was brilliant. The last thing, the last place I'd play him was there. You go and play him centre forward, you need a centre half. Steve Bruce. It's 2 0. It was possibly the toughest task we had, was, uh, was the Montpellier one away and at home, was, was arguably the well, most difficult round. And United, two goals to the good. 3-1 on aggregate, two away goals. I thought that was probably uh, our best performance other than the final itself. It was quite eventful, uh, a lot of incident in it, but uh, deserved to go through. That was, you know, that was a, a very good uh, away per performance from the lads and it was you know, a real part of the learning curve for us in Europe. Leslie Warsaw was the biggest pitch in world football, I think, then it was like 140 yards long, which suited us in a way because Lee Sharp was very, very quick. So he was just belting past to the fullback. So it was a very, very open game over there. It was a funny old stadium as well. It, was, it wasn't a proper stadium. There was like people stood around the pitch without uh, stands there. It was, it was strange. Um, but that's what it was like, I suppose, back in the early days when we got back in Europe. Where's your Warsaw pitch? is an absolute massive, you know, it's big, big wide pitch, open spaces everywhere. And we played really, really well. I remember starting the game really well and feeling very comfortable. And as, a, as the manager says, sometimes <laughs> in Europe, the roof can just fall in the score. And we're 1 0 down, you're thinking, how's that happened? And a chance now, and a goal! See if uh, Sharp can do something about redeeming this situation. Everybody in there, Webb's in there, McClay's in there! That's it's exactly one what one. we needed. That is brilliant. I've already underestimated player Chalky. You know, he's, he's a fantastic player, you know, when I, for, for, for the club. Um, ran his socks off. Um, always popped up, popped up with important goals as well. Um, yeah, I mean, unbelievable that he scored in every, every round uh, prior to the final. Dragger stayed down, Hughes, a little dummy by him. Oh, oh fabulous goal, Mark Hughes! Irving, Hughes, on a rapid turn there, gets the little cross in. It's not away yet by any means, McClare's in there, Bruce is in there! It's another one! It's Steve Bruce! Won it comfortably in the end, 3-1. Uh, and after that, all we, all we had to do was really see it through at all traffic. Three one up, and you know, we, I mean, we didn't really go bombing ball. We just didn't want to give anything away, and I think that that came out in the result. You know, one one. Maybe if it had gone for them, we might, you know, we might have uh, won by a few more.
was a nightmare for defenders. Um, I think it was his crossing ability as well that really stood out. Once he hit the byline at great pace, he had the, uh, the calmness to deliver great balls into the box as well. So, again, when you're looking at you know, people hitting the peak, I mean, that was you know, one of his peak years without a shadow at, uh, at United. He was, he was absolutely awesome that season. He was very direct, very forceful in his running. He had shades of Gareth Bale, you would say, because he was obviously burst on the scene and uh, nobody had heard from him. I think he came from Torquay and uh, turned up one day and uh, I think he actually tried to nutmeg me, which uh, didn't go down too, too well. So uh, he was put in his place. But uh, yeah, when, when he burst into the side, he was, uh, he was really direct. Ryan Robson will lead his men to the Cup Winners' Cup final in Rotterdam next month for one of the great footballing occasions of the season. Well, he won the Cup Winners' Cup with Aberdeen back in 1983. Will he win it with Manchester United in 1991? We were fifth or sixth in the league at the time in that, so it was our, our chance for silverware and, you know, what a great night it was. The only sort of uh, interference to a certain degree was uh, the shock of Archie Knox uh, moving on to Rangers uh, just before it. I was disappointed uh, because Archie had been with me for a long time, from Aberdeen days and then to United, and he was part of the, the what would you say, the resurrection of the club. You know, the, the work he put in with me, uh, with all the young players and the coaching at night time, and you know that it was a big loss to us that way. There's never a perfect time for that. And it was a disappointment for for me as well because you felt as if you were leaving Alec in the lurch a little bit, although he had plenty of staff round about him uh, uh, to cope with, with anything like that. But um, I certainly it was a, a big disappointment for me to to have to leave uh, just in the week, I think, of the, of the, of the European uh, final against Barcelona. We couldn't match Rangers' financial offer. That was it, the nuts and bolts. Manchester United couldn't match Rangers. It's ridiculous when you think about it. But you know, at that time, Martin Edwards had his his uh, financial structures at the time for staff, and he wasn't wasn't prepared to change it, which was disappointing for me. The boss didn't want to bring anybody else who was different in, uh, you know. So he just brought Eric Harrison up from the youth team, and Eric came along with us um, and did a bit of the coaching. And I thought that was a great move from the gaffer because Eric's a great bloke and a very good coach. That was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, I loved it really. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather be down there than, than up in the stands. You know, you can, you can get a little bit more excited down there and I'm a bit excitable really and I loved every minute of it. The manager with him winning the competition with Aberdeen uh, years before uh, he was really keen to follow on from the FA Cup and win a competition again. If you've got a little bit of background knowledge, if you've got the experience of being there before, you can always pass down those thoughts to, to players that haven't been there. But we had, we had a few players who were international footballers as well. You know, we weren't, uh, we weren't inexperienced in that department, but it was just putting it all together. The manager had the difficult task of, of naming the, the, the right team because I think we'd, uh, we'd got beat in the previous final just before that against Sheffield Wednesday. I think that we did go, under, go as underdogs. He's always remember Steve Archibald for me. <clears throat> and um, I said, were you on the spy? Because he played for Barcelona, lives in Barcelona. <clears throat> Which anyway, because I'd, I'd gone to the game with Steve two or three weeks before, and Stojkovic done his hamstring in the game. I was about the final. Was, it was good news. That was a huge boost for us, I think, because he played such an important role in Barcelona and actually getting to the final. Um, he'd really come to the fore as a world player on a world stage. Um, so when he was missing from that final lineup, I think it was a it was a huge shot in the arm for the boys because that's one one important threat that was that was missing from the Barcelona side. Uh, I knew I'd come to a massive club, and then you get this run of European football, and you think this is this is where you want to be. This is what you want more of and to get to the final and then you know who you're playing against, they don't come any better than that. It's good to win domestic competitions, but to actually go on and play against the best players in Europe and actually win a competition, uh, that was another great challenge for everybody. I'd gone to see him a couple of times and I was quite confident with you know, how they played, you know, and 
also we played Barcelona in the final, you know, it's not going to be an easy game. It wasn't an easy game, but you know, I think we're the better team. Mr Ferguson pulled a, a master stroke. It's not often in a team talk we're all scratching our heads where we man marked their centre half. And I gave Brian McQuarrie the one job just to look after Cumin. Stop Cumin playing and he did it fantastically well. He pointed to me and said, uh, if you do your job today we'll win. He was the one who started all their play and set their play up. When they're in possession, you make sure you're inside his shots. When we've got the ball, we can do whatever we want to do. So it was um, exciting and scary at the same time. in nerves and training and said just give us a shout you know so I thought that's a strange one you know I was telling the manager and um, afterwards he said what do you think and we all said Incy looked really nervous. Incy for instance in the, in the dressing room beforehand was white he won't mind me saying that either you know he was just all caught up in the whole thing but uh, we were a young we were a young team and it, we were not really great experience at it so to come through it was terrific a great night fantastic night. It was like a dream come true. First year I played in the FA Cup final, and then you know second year I'm playing against you know Barcelona and Koeman and people like that. And um, I remember being really nervous for some reason. Uh, I was only 22, 23. I was sat on the bus coming at the stadium, and um, you know I, I, I knew the nerves were, were were getting hold of me, and I was you know I was a little bit more nervous than usual. And uh, I was kind of trying to find a way to deal with it, and I just decided to shut everybody out. Stop listening to what was going on in the bus, the banter that was going on there. Just to just sort of lock myself away from it all and, and gather my thoughts and, and just think about what lay ahead. And uh, it had a great effect on me, I think. It's the only occasion I can ever remember it happening. Um, but I think it did help me calm down a, a lot before the game. Otherwise, I might have been a little bit like Incy was in the dressing room. But uh, yeah, it's when, when people talk about the zone, I, cer I certainly think I found it that night. Bobby Charlton, I think he came in the dressing room that night and you know, I think that was one of the first times I've ever heard him say play, play the game, don't play the occasion. Manchester United Barcelona final is as good as they come. Um, we, we felt confident, we still felt as though we could on a one-off game beat anybody. Um, Barcelona were a huge club, big players, but we had probably a little ingredient in that Sparky had been sort of at Barcelona, left Barcelona and we knew a little bit about them, but Sparky had a little point to prove, I think, as well. And they certainly did that in the final. Well, this is the old tunnel that we walked down in 1991. It's no longer in use, the tunnel's on the other side of the pitch. This is where we, we came walking down side by side with the, with the famous Barcelona team, uh, the favourites to, to win on the night, and the adrenaline was pumping. You could hear the crowd as we got to probably about this point, and uh, I'm sure there was a lot of nerves in there, certainly in our team and in that Barcelona side. And just listen to the noise as Manchester United and Barcelona take to the field. A typical Catalan scene, and there are the United supporters at the other end. We've got firecrackers, we've had wind, we've had rain here in Rotterdam today, but all that doesn't matter now. Rotterdam on a horrible, dark, misty, grey evening, pouring down with rain. Everywhere we looked in, in Rotterdam was my new fans. United really have been splendid ambassadors in part. I think it was that intense. And you didn't want to let your teammates down or the club and everything else. You go do your job right. I just I didn't even realise it had rained and all the fans there was no there was no roof on the stadium so they all got soaked but it didn't seem to bother them at the end of the game. Alex magnificent isn't it? Ah, what, eh? what an atmosphere! Fantastic. Well, hope's a great night for them. Everybody felt, you know, this is another turning point for Manchester United. If we can get another European trophy under their belt, then 
they'd be up and running. Barcelona wearing the blue strip. Get the European Cup Winners' Cup final underway. Manchester United in a strip of all white. Johan Cruyff had said about the two centre-backs being hated weren't too adept at passing the ball. I think it was about 15, 20 minutes into the game and Brian McClare made a great run and I slid the ball through when he went one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Unfortunately, he blazed it over the bar. But I felt like turning to Johan Cruyff and, and saying, see, we aren't too bad. That was a glorious opportunity and Brian McClare, who scored in every round. What a good pass by Pallister. Shaw, Robson. Black stays down, and Hughes on his way, Nando's after him. Hughes now, onto that right foot. When we watched him, the problem was the way that Loudrup played for them. Because they played the two wide players as they always do, but without Stojkovic, they played Loudrup right up, whereas they've been playing on wide left prior to that. And, and I said, well, he's not going to play right through, he's going to drop in all the time. I said to Bruce and Pallister, don't go on don't go forward, don't lose the spaces. Miss kick there, can Sharp take advantage of it? Can McClare take advantage of it? They're all over the place, will it fall for Lee Sharp? It's just gone wide. Everybody knows how tough Sparky was and the way he could hold the ball up. Uh, but on that night, it was his evening, you, you know, with the two goals that he got. I think he stole the first goal. I want to say that. I think he stole it from uh, Steve Bruce. Steve Bruce never forgiven him for his day. Because <laughs> it was going in, I think. His head was going in. Bruce, he still tries to claim one from the final. Well, it's my goal. I understood that. And I think Brian, it was one that picked me out. But it was one of them horrible headers where I headed it. And it hit my shoulder. And it took it over the goalkeeper. But I'm just going to say to you, if you look at the footage, look and come and see who celebrates with me. I think it's practically the whole team, apart from Uzi. I was a striker and I was, I was there to score goals. and. Uh... I was conscious, obviously, when it's Brucey obviously headed the ball goalwards. I'm thinking that there's bound to be a defender who's going to run back as I'm running forward to try and clear off the line. So my intention was just to make sure he went over the line. I wasn't trying to nick his goal or whatever, but uh, he probably feels a little bit aggrieved. It was one of the most disappointing things as well when I look back and when you score in a European Cup final, you think, yes, what dreams are made of. You've just scored in the European Cup final, then through the mist and the haze, I looked up and said, Hughes, 62 minutes. Hughes? I just jogged, jogged back to the halfway line and then looked up at the screen and there was my name. I didn't even know you'd tapped it in. I just knew by the reaction of that it was going in anyway, whether who tapped it in or what went on, but we'll have that debate forevermore. OK, you can all jump on Bruce and give him a hug, but uh, I've scored the goal. I can remember Sparky's second when he takes a, a ball out wider and then as only he would you know, instead of side footing it in the goal, he thunders it into the into the goal for a for a great finish. Everybody, I think, knew once that second goal went in that uh, there'd be no comeback for them. There's a chance for another one here. Maybe not now. Yes, there is a fantastic goal by Hughes. Spreads his arms wide and probably makes the game safe for United. chipped it over for Sparky to go through, uh, but then he had to go wide and he hit a fantastic shot, you know, to put us 2-0 up. I think everybody in the dugout was, was shouting, what are you doing, Matt, what are you doing? It sounded to lasted for an eternity, it was only seconds, which seemed minutes, you know, because he was out wide and we kept saying, square it, square it, square it, and it went whoosh, <laughs> it flew in the back of the net and everybody said, great goal, Matt. Unbelievable. From my point of view, I just felt it was an open goal and it was an empty net. Um, so, yeah, I could have taken a couple more touches and made sure with a side foot, but thankfully I didn't because I was unaware that there was two defenders really sprinting back to try and get back to clear it. So it was a good job that I just thought I'd put my foot through this and make sure that it's back in the net. and. And it was a good job I did because I think they would have cleared it if I'd have tried just to roll it in. So, um, yeah, great moments. I mean, obviously, my time in Barcelona wasn't as successful as I, I hoped it would have been, but uh, I had great memories of being a player there. But uh, it was 
it was sweet, obviously, when you go up against a team you've been part of, then you want to show that actually the, you're a better player than you were able to show when you were there, and that certainly was the case for me. Barcelona had, had more or less discarded him, you know, that sent him out and loan to Bayern Munich. That's where we signed him from Bayern Munich, I think, if memory serves me right. Um, but because I travelled out to Munich to talk to him, you know, about coming back to United. Uh, and it was a great moment for him. You know, I think it justified his, uh, you know, his disappointing time at Barcelona and, and laid that course to rest for him. Make it. It's Lauder again. Oh, that's a lovely bit of play on the ground by Lauder. And the challenge by uh, Robson. No. Two nil up, you think, you know, you've got it. It's, it, it's done. And then with the free kick that happened, you know, you always feel as though a man of his capability has done it many, many times before. You just fingers crossed, you hope that he doesn't hit the target or it's it wide over the top. But watch Kuman. He has got the most explosive free kick. He's renowned for it throughout European football. Here's Kuman with the free kick. And it's in there! But he put it right in the corner and, and Les, Les struggled to get down to it. And I think he got a hand to it and, and, it, and it went in. And then you start to think, right, what do we do here now? Do we, do we hold on to what we've got or do we keep attacking? I was at the point of shooting Wes Sealy at that moment, you know, because he started, he'd, he'd got a knee injury against Sheffield Wednesday in the final of the League Cup. And it was a pretty bad gash, of course, but the minute he was to go, he started limping and starting putting his hand up, must you say, I'm finished. And I'm really just going, you bloody, you quit, I'll tell you, I'll kill you. You know, and so it was, a, it, was a, it was a panic at the last 10 minutes, of course. Clean Blackmore kicked one off the line in the last few minutes of the match. You know, if it had gone the extra time, I think, I don't think Les would have been playing an extra time. Once they scored with the, uh, the Ronnie Koeman free kick, uh, the momentum changed. They were obviously chasing the game. We were, we were trying to hang on. And uh, I think it was in the last minute of the game that um, Brucey made a, a pass back uh, to Les that didn't get there. And I remember giving a bad pack pass and, and it getting cut out and put the loud up and loud up short. And I think Blackmore got it off the line. <laughs> Thank the Lord, otherwise it wouldn't have been allowed in Manchester again. Canelia's getting in there. It could be problems here. Celia's lost it again. And Lauder kicked off the line by Blackmore. Instinct for her, you've got to, you know, defend him. And I've just got in behind Les because Les had come off his line and luckily I was in the right spot. Clear off the line. It was unbelievable. My legs were shaking. I couldn't stop my legs shaking, you know. It took about 10 minutes. It seemed to be about 10 hours. But it was all worthwhile because it was a fantastic win and, and everybody went absolutely berserk at the final whistle. We just kept going and threw our bodies at things and uh, in the end we came out on top. And they were a good side as well. The likes of Koeman and Laudrup playing on their side. And um, we had to be on a metal, but um, in the end, uh, the team that was better on the night, which was us, I think, overall. I mean, deserved to win. Manchester United are the winners! Two goals for one after a win of 23 years! Oh, it's magnificent. Look at that. This is the boot. It's the club that's what Manchester United's about. Winning the biggest thing you can possibly win. You don't like to run after your teammates. You don't like to fall on the floor in exhaustion. You don't like to run around like a lunatic. Um, so we all just really ended up in a, in, a, in a pile of people just jumping you know, with each other and just celebrating. It's, it's, it's a high emotional thing, it's difficult to, uh, to describe. You just, everything happens all at once, all the hard work you've put in throughout the year because it's your last game, uh, it just tops it all off. Yeah, it's, it's ecstasy, you know, you're playing against one of the best teams and best club teams in the world and you know, we've turned them over, you know, first time back in Europe. Um, you know, it's, it's what dreams are made of. This was my first medal and they always say it kind of passes in the blur and that's certainly the case. You can enjoy that moment straight away with, the, with your teammates and the manager runs onto the pitch and the coaches and the substitutes and the staff and you, and you share that moment together. I always remember at the end of the game, the Barcelona fans, where they made it a lot of, a lot of noise before the game with the fireworks and everything. Right at the end of the game, the stand was still three quarters full. And then you sort of turn to the fans as well, and you you just you just go mental. And I think there was another five, ten thousand outside watching it. But yeah, I don't think you can argue with it, the fact that we deserved the victory. I think Bruce might have even jumped on 
jumped on my back, I think. In that, in that game, when we sort of, I, I was catching, I wouldn't be able to carry him now, but I'd certainly at the time, I, I, I sort of carried him from a bit over to the fans, and we just, you know, all the emotion came out, the, you know, from the supporters, from the players, and um, that's why you play football to, to get them kind of feelings, whether it be a cup final, winning a league title, or a, a cup winners' cup. To win and, and celebrate is is what you play the game for. Three quarters of the team peaked on the evening. When I look back, I, I thought it was one of my better games as well. I'd heard all about Brian and had the privilege to play with him. But on the night he was, well I was 31, so he must have been approaching 34, 35. I thought he'd give one of his best performances in a man new shirt. You know, I, I did an interview on the, on, the, on the side of the pitch as I, as I was going around and I, you know, I wasn't making any sense. I was just telling everybody how brilliant it was and I think that was the only word I could use at the time. Congratulations! Ah, uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That's brilliant as well. That's, I've been just brilliant. How does this moment compare to the rest in your career? Oh, this is the best thing that's ever happened, I tell you. It's magnificent. Uh, just delighted for everybody who'd been there, everybody involved, and it, it, it continued that, that idea of that. Uh, We've beaten one of the best teams in Europe and that let's look forward to the celebrations and next season. There was beer, there was champagne, there was um, just celebrations and uh, yeah, well that, that, yeah, again that's a big part of winning football games. It was around about the time of the drug testing situations and we were allowed um, time in the dressing room but not a lot because they wanted to know where you were, who you, you know, what you were up to. Because he was so dehydrated, um, it took him forever <laughs> before he could give a sample. I could tell that everybody was getting a bit frustrated because I was holding people up from going back to the hotel to meet the families. And in the end, the manager just literally said, that's it, we're going, we're leaving you. And I thought, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like the good room partner I was, decided to, to stay with him while he, while he tried to, to go at the top. If I knew it was going to take an hour, I might not have bothered. I can hear them shutting down the ground and I can hear them turning the lights off. And uh, we turned up a little bit late at the party, yeah. The reception that night was the best ever. All the players that were there that night say that was the best ever reception. Because they tell we had it ourselves, of course. But as we come into the door, this big fountain of champagne. Now, this is the, where I had the best party of my life. Um, it's a little bit different now, it's all open plan. This was a, just one big room, it was all, you know, there was just doors going into a room. And all these windows wouldn't have been there then. Uh, so it was enclosed, it was very private. And, uh, you know, it didn't take very long before the party got into full swing. You know, when the champagne just flowed all night, you know, all the glasses all stacked up. I don't know how they do that, but in some way, there's some way of doing it anyway. And the buffet was right round, uh, but, you know, most of the tale, it was absolutely fantastic. The party was great, <laughs> fantastic. I mean, as you would expect it to be, because I think when you win something, you should always celebrate it. And, um, yeah, it was uh, party long into the night, I remember that. Well, I remember the first two or three hours of it, then I don't remember a great deal after that. I know that I, don't, I didn't go to bed, I know that. Um, I remember Mick Hutton being here on the dance floor spinning on his back, uh, <laughs> which was quite funny. Uh, apart from that, the rest was a blur because I was out, I was out in my head. Uh, but it was, it was one of those special, special nights at Manchester United. I'll never forget the manager coming around with a box of cigars and, and offering it to me. And I thought, oh, is this a trick? <laughs> is he going to see what I'm going to do? Is he going to see whether I like, to, like a cigar, whether he thought I was a smoker or what? So I can't remember whether he actually took the cigar or not, but uh, I'm sure by the end of the night I'd have been smoking one. All of us celebrated the way it should be. I think we went to bed at seven and got up at half past. I've seen pictures in the morning, obviously, with the trophy and uh, look a bit worse for the wear, to be perfectly honest. This is the lift that I got stuck in on the, uh, the morning after the party. Uh, it's as I remember, it, was, it, it, it looked knackered then, it still looks knackered now. And uh, yeah, it must have been about eight or nine o'clock in the morning. It was kind of an early, early set off to, to get to the airport. And uh, myself, Neil Webb, my Mrs. Mary, and um, the FA representative, Adrian Titicum, that's his real name, um, got stuck for about 10 minutes in there. 
And uh, you can imagine with a hangover, started to get a little bit claustrophobic in there, a little bit sweaty. Um, so there was a bit of a panic. Fortunate these two ladies didn't get stuck in there. A friend of mine had come to the, um, uh, the game because uh, my wife had had a kid and she couldn't fly, so yeah, he, uh, he had a, he was well, he loved it, you know. So, so we would get down for breakfast and uh, Robo came down. And he said to my mate, he says, uh, Chris, you come with me. So she says, what, what was it? Come on, come here. So he went back into the bar and ordered a bottle of champagne. He says, it will look as if it's the champagnes for you. <laughs> if you didn't really knew or know of the actual enormity of what it meant to win a European Cup, then we certainly did when we got home. It was terrific. What do you think of the fans, Manchester United? Well, I mean, the second to none, really. I mean, they went over there yesterday and it was a bad evening and uh, they all got soaking wet, but it didn't care monkeys to them. Um, they all sang their hearts out. And when, he can, when, when a set of supporters can outnumber the likes of Barcelona by 70 to 30, by the way, a look to, a, we, where we were looking, uh, is something to shout about. The open top bus uh, around the city, yeah, you know, that was great. And it was a fantastic turnout from the fans again. Uh, but it was a long day. You know, you've got so many people out and cheering you on. I, I think I even saw a few City fans in there. We got on the bus at the, at the, at the airport and then went down by Eccles. It was, obviously it was, it was on a momentous occasion, but for some reason we stayed to go through all, all the districts of Manchester. So in a way through Eccles and coming right down through Salford and into town and right out to Old Trafford and, Kind of took about six hours or something, but we're absolutely freezing. It's a cold day, but I just think it shows the affection of Manchester United and what the supporters think of us. At the press conference the day after the game, I said, we, we, This team can go and win the league now. And after it, Dave Meek got a hold of me and says, You're a wee bit positive there. I said, Christ David, for winning a European Cup, why can't we win a league? The boss has, has always been a winner and, you know, he, he just, from season to season, he, he's got to win. So as soon as you finish and you've won that tournament, he's talking about the next season and going on to achieve things again. That was probably the catalyst for what we did, even more than the, the Cup final. You know, because a European one, where you look at the history, of the, you know, the Busby Bird and all that business, and then you think, we're on that ladder now. I do believe like, winning the FA Cup in 90 and 91, the European competition, I think that give everybody the belief that we're good enough to, to go on and beat anybody. 